So Loftus went a little further and suggested that reliability of memory is not only influenced by reconstruction, okay, rather it can even involve something that she referred to as false memories. And false memories are memories that we create despite there having been no real occurrence of it. Okay, maybe for example, in this experiment that she uh, that I will show you is some people were able to recall that they were lost in a mall when they were really young, even though this never really happened. Okay, and I think there are some experiments around um, UFO sightings, and <laughs> obviously that uh, I'm not going to say obviously, but maybe right. That's something that has never really happened, but people are able to recall it just because they were suggested or just because these researchers or people implanted these false memories into them, okay? And such research has a lot of implications, more so with regards to psychotherapy, which is counseling, okay? Um, it makes the job of counselors far more tricky because the whole idea is to ask questions and also to bring about different perspectives, but at what point are we able to do that in a sense that it doesn't negatively impact a person, not just our client um, or the person we're counseling, but also maybe the other people around them. Because suggestibility or questions or leading questions or bringing about different perspectives can actually in fact result in false memories or distortions in memories which might not necessarily be true to the real life situation. Okay, And this video really goes over her Loftus and Pickerel's 1995 study. So, yeah. In her challenge to the idea of repressed memory, Elizabeth Loftus set out to demonstrate experimentally how false memories could be implanted in some people. This came to be known as the lost in the mal technique from the first study that involved trying to plant false childhood memories in 24 participants. We contacted their mother or their father or an older relative of theirs and then we went back to the subject and we said, we've been talking with your mother. Uh, we found out some things that happened to you when you were about five or six years old. And we'd like to see what you can remember about these experiences that your mother told us about. Participants were given three true experiences and a false one that involved being lost in a shopping mall as a six-year-old. Your mother told us that you were shopping at the, at the corner uh, shopping mall on a Saturday one, one time and you were by the pet store and all of a sudden you disappeared and you were gone for the longest period of time and eventually we found you, you were crying and an elderly woman had uh, rescued you and brought you back to the, the main office. Do you remember that experience? The researchers were able to plant false memories in 25% of their participants, a statistically significant figure. And what surprised them was the rich detail of these false memories. And they would start telling us things, um, details about the, the appearance of the person who rescued them, other, other kinds of details that, uh, that we had never mentioned to them. So, so that showed that they were putting a lot of sensory detail uh, onto this created memory. From this investigation, Loftus set out what she thought was the recipe for planting false memories. First, you need the client's trust. And therapists usually had that. Then you suggest something that might have happened and bring in persuasive supporting evidence. So she would go into therapy with an eating disorder or depression or whatever her problem is and she'd end up with a therapist who says everyone I've seen with those problems was sexually abused as a child. I wonder if anything like that happened to you. So third, you ask clients if they can remember this happening to them sometimes they begin to add their own details. They take ownership of the memory. This was going on really all across North America and then other parts of the world. Families were being destroyed in the process because once people develop these memories, they then accuse their family members or, uh, or other relatives uh, or other former neighbors or former teachers, former anybody. The Lost in the Mole study 
The Formation of False Memories, was published in 1995, and critics were quick to point out some limitations. First, it was a small sample with only 24 participants. Second, being lost in the mall as a child is quite a common experience. Maybe it really had happened to some of the participants. And third, it was hardly a traumatic experience, not comparable to those being uncovered by repressed memory therapists. Yeah, so again, this experiment involved implanting false memories in the participants. And obviously that could bring about a lot of ethical issues because it could cause distress and other conflicts um, in the participants. But apart from that, this again goes on to suggest that there are many factors that lead into our understanding that um, memory is actually quite unreliable. Um, and the next experiment that I will discuss is a one by Yul and Kutschel in 1986. They claim that memory is actually reliable. As I mentioned earlier, a major drawback in most of Loftus and other experiments is that they lack ecological validity, which is um, there isn't really real life application because the, uh, the environment is so artificial and the variables are so highly controlled and this is not how it really occurs in real life. So Yul and Kachal, they actually used a naturally occurring um, robbery that happened in Canada, okay? And they interviewed the witnesses of the real crime. So now this is a naturalistic experiment and um, this meant, means that there is going to be ecological validity, okay? So in the experiment, or rather in the, in the, th uh, robbery, sorry, um, the participants or the witnesses witnessed a gun shooting, okay? So the thief entered a gun shop, uh, he tied up the owner uh, of the shop and stole money and guns, okay? And then he made a run for it. So the owner managed to free himself, uh, he grabbed a revolver and went out to basically check the number plate of the thief or the thief's car, okay? But he realized that the thief hadn't left yet and the thief saw that the owner had freed himself and hence fired two shots at the owner, and which caused the owner to be quite injured. Um, following that, the store owner shot six shots back at the thief and killed the thief. Okay, um, There were two, uh, 21 witnesses that were around that scene. Um, they were either driving by or they were at the in that area. So they were interviewed by the police right after the event occurred. Uh, and 13 of those 21 witnesses agreed to participate in the research. Okay, And now Yul and Kachal wanted to see whether the um, participants would be able to recall the scene or the event as clearly as they did right when the police interviewed them. Okay, so four months later, the witnesses were called again by the researcher and they were interviewed, but they were also divided into two groups. Okay, half the groups received some sort of leading question and the other half were not given any leading questions. And what was found that when the researchers compared the um, recall that they did four months after the event to the initial verbatims of the what the police interviewed the participants for they all were quite similar in which then means that participants were able to recall uh, a majority of the details accurately and this again goes on to um, contradicting the idea that memory is not really reliable and the fact that this was conducted in a natural environment um, based on a really uh, a, a real life situation then goes on to support the idea that maybe memory is reliable and that in real life situations when there is something that is distress distressing that happens to us, we are in fact able to remember it quite well. Okay, uh, again, so this is a very good research to use in an, ex uh, in an answer, okay, um, to give kind of like a contradictory perspective and it is also what we will be moving on to next which is the influence of emotions on memory and one of the biggest uh, theories that we will be referring to is the flashbulb memory theory okay um, for this 
chapter on the reliability of memory. Um, the questions can be with regards uh, to LAQ at least can be on um, discussing um, the reliability of memory with reference to research. In that case, you will try using different factors because it's a discussion and discussion involves using a breadth of understanding, okay? Um, so you would talk about maybe weapon effect uh, or leading questions and maybe even involve this idea that emotions might in fact make um, memory reliable, okay? And then the second possibility could be an evaluate research um, conducted on understanding the reliability of memory. So in that case, you could use two opposing researches, one which is a lab experiment and one which is a naturalistic uh, experiment, and evaluate the research procedure and how that helps us understand reliability of memory. Okay, And the final option would be um, to what extent is memory reliable? And again, in such a question, you should be able to provide two sides of the argument and not just one side uh, even though there is a lot of evidence and factors suggesting that memory is not reliable, um, if you write your answer only from that perspective, it's not going to achieve a lot of um, high grades. Okay, So you can provide contradictory information to suggest that, yes, there are several factors that can make memory reliable, uh, unreliable, but a lot of this has been suggested based on experiments, Okay, and um, there are loopholes in those experiments, especially with regards to ecological validity. This then goes on to suggest that a natural experiment like that of Yule and Cutshell can suggest that there is reliability in memory, um, especially when something is emotionally triggering. Okay, So with that, we end um, the chapter on reliability of memory. We will, to finish off again, we will watch uh, a TED talk by Loftus and uh, Loftus, Elizabeth Loftus, and that will really just summarize everything that we've done in this chapter. All right, so that's what you'll be doing next. Um, and there's no homework for the weekend, so yay. <laughs> okay, bye bye.